Welcome to Gray Matter with Michael Krasny. In this episode of our weekly podcast, we're going to explore the wonders and mysteries of the natural world of fauna and flora with Tennessee-born grandfather, naturalist, and <laughs> head of Footloose Forays, Michael Ellis. Footloose Forays is a, basically a travel agency. Michael started it back in 1983. He leads guided nature excursions throughout the world, and I've long appreciated his extensive knowledge and passion for the natural world and the wonders we all too often neither observe enough or appreciate. And I welcome the irrepressible and passionate travel guide, educator, columnist, biologist, and botanist, and beloved speaker, Michael Ellis, to this episode of Gray Matter. Wow, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, it's an honorific uh, introduction to a uh, dromomaniac. Um, <laughs> he knew what dromomania was, uh, which impressed me. Some of you who don't know that word, dromomania is the excessive desire to travel, and he does that. Now we do something a little different here. Um, people are going to ask all kinds of questions of you of the natural world, and you know, we're going to talk about travel. And so I think I remember once asking you about the most extraordinary and spectacular place in your mind, all the places you've traveled. I think you said, I may be wrong, but I think you said the Serengeti, um, and that stood out for you. And it'd be interesting to hear from some people as to what stands out when you think of, I hate to use that adolescent word, awesome, but I mean, in the real semantic meaning of it, what inspires awe. Um, I think of New Zealand, by the way, and I have a friend who had a travel agency who said, Great Barrier Reef, you know, people think of things like that right off the bat. And uh, for you, I guess it was the Serengeti, still is. You yeah. got a shirt on that says Serengeti. Yes, I do. Yes, it was the staff that I just left behind. After seven weeks, I was in I was in Tanzania for seven weeks, which was lovely. I always go around January, February when all the wildebeest are there. But I got to say, the reason I think that my heart belongs there is because that that's where all the human beings originated from. So when I go back to the Serengeti, I feel in um, almost every way like I'm going home. You know, the the Serengeti, the savanna, the trees. Uh, the water courses, they're kind of hardwired in human beings. I think it's fixed in our DNA that we feel super comfortable in these places. And that's how I feel when I go back home. There's a novel I love by Sal Bellow called Henderson, the Rain King, all about, you know, wanting to go to Africa to discover what our real roots are and all that. Um, but it's interesting, though, I ran into a friend recently who is a podiatrist and he's retired. And I said, uh, what are you going to do now in retirement? He said, I don't know. You got any suggestions? I said, well, people claim they go to Africa and it changes their life. And he said, I don't want to change my life. <laughs> okay. I don't want to change my shoes either. They're perfect. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, people do say that after going to Africa. Tanzania, I saw on your website, you got a picture of a hippo pool in, San, in, Tanzan, in North Tanzania, I guess. It yeah, yeah. No, it's just, uh, yeah, it does change people's lives. Uh, I just took like 50 people to Tanzania, not all at one time. They were in three different safaris of 16 people. But, you know, it's basically the trip of their life. And most people kind of go, wow, uh, that was amazing. When can I go back? You know, or they want to go to a different part of, of East or Southern Africa. You know, so it's a big continent. One fifth of the world's land mass is in the continent of Africa. You could put the continental United States inside the Sahara Desert. Most people have no idea how big Africa is. It's huge. Well, and you're going to Namibia in April, right? Well, I went to Namibia last April. That was an, a, a, a trip that I did with some friends just for fun. I had been to Namibia in 2007, again in 2008, but I hadn't been back. And I wanted to, speaking of dromomania, I needed to get out of town. And um, so well, was I, this because of the revenue, internal revenue service? <laughs> oh, beaming in April? <laughs> no, I just needed to, to uh, you know, I'm a dromomaniac, you know, you described me that way. And so I had to get out of town. So I went to Namibia. And that's a nice place because it's, we only have two and a half million people there. It's a one and a half times the big, as big as Texas. They speak English there. The only problem is they drive on the wrong side of the road. Other than that, it's the perfect country to visit. And I love deserts. Um, and I hired a local guide. It's one of the places you can actually self-drive if you want to. You know, it's it's well-designed country. Uh, but I always believe in having local guides. So we had a fantastic time. Well, Africa, as a Chinese, you're discovering there's much to explore there. And, oh, yeah. Uh, much to see. When I was in school, in elementary school, I used to call it the dark continent. You know, mm -hmm. It was like it didn't even exist in any significant way, but there's much beauty there. I mean, I hear about Rwanda all the time as a beautiful place to visit. Yeah, that's the most densely populated country in Africa. Um, they've done a really good job of reconciliation, as they said, after the, the horrors of the genocide. And, uh, you know, I've 
I used to go trekking there for the mountain gorillas. That's a, they've incorporated, um, it's very, very pricey to go, but about 80% of your money that you spend to go spend an hour with mountain gorillas goes to the local community. So it's a way in which you can reinforce the connection between the preservation of the species and the financial, um, the, the financial benefits of the local people, which is critical if you want to save anything on the planet. You've got to figure out how local people can live and survive and thrive next to the wild things of the planet. Otherwise, just kiss it all goodbye. Those are all tough questions, though. I mean, you know, when you're weighing in the balance environmental factors, for example, about visiting. I remember uh, Amy Tan, to drop a name, going to Myanmar, Burma, and saying, you know, well, I'm going to help the economy by going there, but it's a terrible regime, and I'm going as a tourist, in effect, to support that regime. You know? Well, I mean, I, I have this dilemma all the time. Think about, you know, my just recent seven weeks in, in Tanzania. I brought 50 people. Imagine that uh, carbon footprint from those people flying from the United States. It's a gray zone. It'd be nice if it was black or white, but it's not, it's gray. So uh, that's a huge carbon footprint. If we didn't bring people into these wild places, then they wouldn't exist. So what is the balance there? And I think about this all the time, about my li- my own personal lifestyle and, and the traveling. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Well, I may, I'll put it out there. We may hear from some of our Listeners today, in terms of how they make that balance, uh, getting some questions already. James from San Diego wants to know, how are untrained citizens becoming more involved in protecting the valuable resources of the planet and helping wildlife? Have some thoughts on that? Untrained citizens. I'm not sure what he means by that. I mean, maybe citizen science, maybe this what he's where, you know, something like iNaturalist, for example, which is getting a lot of press where individuals will record data points that scientists can then later use to analyze distribution or abundance or disappearance of certain species of animals or increasing their their range where they didn't know that before. So in some ways, uh, programs like that technology can aid scientists from individuals that are not necessarily trained in science. Maybe that's what he means. If that's the case, then um, that's the answer to that. Or if it's something like, you know, connection between people that in Africa, for example, that are in the service industry, they're not trained, but they know now not to go out and poach, um, you know, a, a, a bush buck for meat because, oh, wait, tourists like to watch that. I'm not sure exactly what the question meant. Well, a lot of citizens are just utterly unenlightened. You know, they go on these footloose forays and they learn from people like you. Yeah, for the most part, at least my clientele tends to become already pre-adapted. They're already enlightened. They already have a curiosity about the natural world. I think the challenge in our modern culture and with the rise of technology and the young people is getting them, they're already so disconnected as it is through through media and, and screen time that they're spending that, um, you know, it seems more critical to get, and, and, vir- and virtual reality, um, you know, that thing is like kind of scary to me because it's like, well, you can just put on you know, a certain piece of equipment and then go on safari in Africa and maybe have qualitatively <laughs> qualitatively the same experience. I'm not sure. But I think the challenge in the our modern world is getting people connected with the value of wild things and the biodiversity that's so essential to the survival of human beings. I mean, we're, you know, young people are, are totally aware of the climate change a lot better than our generation, the boomer generation are. But, you know, the actions that we need to take are tough choices that we need to make. And most of us, we're not designed to think generations in advance. We're designed to think about our immediate family and how we're we're going to survive and making sure our grandchildren survive. Well, here's a good question apropos what we're talking about in some ways and what we've been touching on from Juan in Mexico City, who says, what's your opinion of virtual tours versus larger quantities of people visiting already delicate ecosystems? Well, that's a good point. Speaking of the barrier reef, you know, and places like that, you can love places to death. They used to call it, I don't know if this is still true, probably not so much, but they used to, the national parks in California used to call a sunsetification when Sunset Magazine would publish something about the wonders of Anza Borrega in March. Well, <laughs> the, the state park guys would go, oh my God, here they come, you know? So, I mean, that's a valid point, you know, that is like, do we love things to death? You know, you would like to think that the entities that are protecting or safeguarding these national or international treasures, let's take the Galapagos Islands as an example, 
would be controlling the numbers of people that visit them. And in reality, because of the economic incentive of letting everybody in, and um, that often is not the case. So again, another gray zone. Well, I was also reading that you are headed to the Antarctica, which many people's minds is a fabulous and spectacular thing to see. And uh, it's good for you for a change not to be in charge, I'm sure. <laughs> but also it started me thinking about, and I know you've been kind of interested in this as well, the whole story about Sir Ernest Shackleton and the endurance. <laughs> I mean, they were living off seals and seaweed for like a couple of years, weren't they? Oh my God. This is, is a story that needs to be told over and over again. Uh, yeah. That is one of the most amazing adventure stories I've ever read and encountered. And I'm actually, I've been to Antarctica before, but I've never been to the South Georgia Islands. And that's the part that I'm really looking forward to kind of retracing their steps, um, Shackleton and that amazing journey, 600 miles of open ocean to find this and to go back and rescue all the guys that he left behind. He rescued every one of them. I'm all 27. Oh my God, that was that. That is just. I got goosebumps just now thinking about that story. I'll get goosebumps when I get to Antarctica. That'll be because of cold, <laughs> not because of the story. But I'm really looking forward, and I'm not in charge, like you said. I'm just going with another organization, so I'll be really happy just to be one of the one of the passengers and understand the benefits of, for example, going with me when I'm in charge. You know, I'll be with somebody else who's in charge and not me. That'll feel good. Yeah, but you might be. Uh at least given to some contentiousness if you disagree with that guy. And <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> ecological matters or whatever. Yeah, I'll try to keep my mouth shut. I'll probably not succeed. I was also reading where you're going to Bhutan in, in 2024, and uh, I think about Shangri-La, and I think about that demonic-looking pilot in that movie, you know, in the beginning, which is probably really anti-Asian when you think about it. Uh, but things are way off in Bhutan? Yeah, mean? I mean, I thought I did my last trip to Bhutan because um, I've been going there since the 2000s. Um, and basically, my friend Sanam, who's a very good friend of mine, it, they're suffering in Bhutan. And I thought, you know, I think I'll just bring a couple more groups there, you know, in 2024 to help him out financially. And I just got a note from him just this morning, actually, saying things are really rough there. Um, so he's looking forward to me me bringing groups again. So maybe I'll start, you know, every every other year or something like that. I'm getting old, you know, so I can't keep doing this, but as long as I can, I, I think I will. It's kind of like you, you are so retiring. You don't look very retired right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a word that I recoil at, actually, <laughs> truth be told. Here's James again from San Diego. He says, please comment. This is probably one of your flock. Uh, please comment on the upcoming camping trip to the Cedars. You wrote, quote, Discovering the wonders of such an alive and ever-changing outer landscape while simultaneously exploring our ever-evolving inner landscape. <laughs> oh, that sounds like so West Marin slash Sonoma County does and a little woo-woo. Well, it's true, actually, because this, this is an amazing geologic formation in Western Sonoma County, which is like 5,000 acres of the California State Rock, which is serpentine. Um, and it's just a place where, you know, you can't believe it's hard. First of all, it's hard to get in. So I think, you know, there was a famous naturalist, Joseph Wood Crutch, who said something like bad roads make good country, which is totally true. So, you know, seven stream crossings to get into this place. Some friends of mine own this little um, enclave that we can use with within this uh mostly BLM land on all surroundings and stuff. And so this is just a place where there's this kind of upswelling, if you will, of the geologic of the serpentine rock just coming out. And as it as it it's constantly evolving like a loaf of bread. And as the water uh, interacts with it, um, these hyperalkaline springs come bubbling out and form these beautiful travid travertine formations that look like wedding cakes everywhere. And it's just uh, exobiologists from NASA regularly come up there to see what kinds of organisms are living in these hyperalkaline springs that could have a pH of 11.5, which is pretty nasty. And so exobiology makes me think of extraterrestrials. Well, that's exactly who they are. What they're looking at is the, um, the possibility that these organisms could have, at one time at least, survived on, say, Mars. So what they're looking at here at the Cedars 
is the evidence that's left behind by these microorganisms, these bacteria that are able to thrive in these hyper uh, alkaline, these extreme conditions. So that's what they mean by exobiologists. So they're looking at this particular place, looking at the patterns so that if the Mars rover or whatever happens to see something like that on Mars, there could be um, suggestions that life did at one time exist on Mars. So that's that's one of the many, many special things about this uh, this particular place. Well, as long as we're talking about California for a moment, I want to go global on this with you, but um, you've talked on a number of occasions about the Redwoods and how it's like a cathedral and the beauty of the Redwoods. Maybe again, getting back to these awe-inspiring and spectacular kinds of things that we've seen, many of us had the delight of seeing and the extraordinary experience of seeing. But people even talk about that again, sounding a little bit woo woo, as spiritual. I mean, they <laughs> use the word cathedral. You know, think of Raymond Carver and all that. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, well, first of all, California. Okay, I, I love California. You you uh, alluded to the fact that I grew up in Tennessee, but once I got to California, I was firmly planted here. So. Uh, but California has what the tallest living thing on the planet Earth, the redwood, the largest single individual tree on the planet Earth, the General Sherman tree in giant, uh, Sequoia National Park, and the oldest living tree, bristlecone pines in the White Mountains. That's all in our great state of California. And more homeless people than anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Enough with that. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, one of the things that is striking to me, just in general, about life. It's just the miracle of it all. I mean, you know, I don't need any religious um, organization to, I mean, all I have to do is go outside and just be amazed by the world around us. I mean, and, and also I want to point out too, you don't have to go to Africa or some exotic place or the Barrier Reef or New Zealand to feel the miracle of life. You walk out in your backyard and just open your eyes to it. I mean, it's it's all around us and it's all a miracle, including those trees that you're talking about that are able to transpire over 300, almost 400 feet, a little molecule as it evaporates out of the top of the leaf at the top of a redwood tree. And there's an unbroken line going all the way down the tree, all the way out into the roots, all the way going out hundreds of feet from the tree to a little tiny root hair that takes in one molecule of water when that one evaporated at the top of the tree. I mean, come on, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Well, in fact, let's go back to Africa, though, for a moment. We can come to return to California. But Susan in Ontario says, how does one prepare for a trip to Africa? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, you 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 want to be sure you have the proper immunizations <laughs> and all of that stuff. Uh, some people don't like to read too much before they go to a place. And I'm kind of that person as well. And because I and I just was talking to some of the people that were recently with me, and it's kind of like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to prepare too much because I want that's somebody else's experience that they had. You know, if you talk about somebody, I want to, I'll show you my pictures of Africa. Well, I don't want to see your pictures of Africa. I'm going to have a whole different experience. You know, so in some ways, it's maybe better not even to prepare, but just, to, I mean, maybe prepare in the way of opening your heart to whatever happens, and to not have expectations about, oh, I want to see a. A, a leopard kill, or I want to see a cheetah, or, or whatever it is. You know, just open, open your mind and your heart to whatever happens as it unfolds, and be super happy about that. Actually, I'd say that's the best way to prepare for a trip to anywhere, but in Africa. That's a good attitude. Yeah. What about all the things you need to bring with you, though? <laughs> well, I have a packing list for that. <laughs> yeah, and so whatever organization you would go with, you know, you want to make sure. Well, first of all. You want to make sure that whatever group you go, any travel, eco travel or whatever, treats their staff well, you know, pays them properly. Um, sometimes that's hard to do research on. You want to make sure that they're ethic ethically. Everybody wants to be green and culturally sensitive, you know, so it's a little more challenging to find out that. But go with people that you or trust people that have gone with another organization, you know, word of mouth. I mean, I, I've never advertised in my whole life for my business. It's all word of mouth, you know? And so that's the best way because then somebody tells you, oh yeah, he's he's a little irreverent and can be a little blunt and direct, but um, you know, he's okay. Is that the worst criticism you hear? Oh no, there's a lot worse <laughs> than that. <laughs> well, let me get back to California for just a moment here. Southern California, that is, because you're chartering a fishing vessel, uh, in San Diego to go south to Baja to see the whales and actually touch them. I like the tactile idea of being able to touch the wheels and avoid the uh, the whale lice that get on your nose. There's a picture on Michael's website of a whale louse on his nose. Um, 
But now we've got uh, a federal judge, uh, just a recent ruling, and be interested in your thoughts on this, uh, saying that wildlife the wildlife officials aren't doing enough about the humpback whales. Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, um, you know, he's calling the Fish and Wildlife U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on their inability to control this. I'm exactly. not sure exactly what the uh, parameters are for the fishing vessels. I assume it's within our territorial waters or in international waters. I'm not sure because sometimes American fishing vessels go out into international waters, and I'm not sure what. Give that. a plug for a podcast we do with Susan Jackson all about those international waters and how they they're actually pretty well. Monitored regulated and regulated yeah oh that's great yeah i don't know about that i know that you know the humpback i mean the gray whale which is the one that you know is down in baja right now that population has rebounded really well um which is nice in fact it's even dropping a little bit not necessarily because of uh, lack of protection or w- over whaling but just perhaps the environment ecosystem has reached its ability to maintain a certain population uh, naturally. So they're they're not being killed or slaughtered, but their populations are dropping just a little bit. But. Is there a thrill in touching a whale? Oh my it? goodness. Well, the reason I'm doing this trip is, is uh, this was the very first international trip that I did um, back in 1980, I guess it was for the Oceanic Society. And I hadn't been there and I haven't done this trip in like 12 years. And I thought, you know, I want to do that again, you know? And so I invited, I didn't even advertise this. I just invited people that had been with me before on this trip to join me again. So basically the boat is almost completely full of people that have done this trip before, which is really fun. So, and we know the skipper really well, we know the boat crew. So it'll be like old home week. I'm really looking forward to it. And there's another naturalist who's been doing this every year. So I don't have to remember things from like 10 years ago. I'm going to let Paul do most of the talking. Well, let me go to some more uh, folks who want to raise questions or get some information from you. Uh, one of our uh, members, Hershed, who's in Central Florida, first of all, he says he's originally from Zambia and wants to know if you can share any experiences you might have had in Zambia. But he wants to know how you feel uh, about experiencing different places virtually, especially those who may not be able. Should we be capturing the sounds of the world before they get impacted? Oh, that's a great question. I, I mean, he knows this. I've crossed the bridge at Victoria Falls and walked to Zambia to cross the border so that I could stick my foot in there and then walk back across the Victoria Falls Bridge. You know, so well, I have a re- Walt Whitman, you are the man. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to bungee jump off that bridge, but I couldn't uh, raise my son to ask him for permission. So I, I, I never did that. But no, that's a really good question. It's like disabled people, for example, or people that just don't have enough money or resources. Why shouldn't they have the ability to experience that? And if I, you know, I haven't actually put one of those things on my head to see what that's like. We know everything anyway is just going on inside your head anyway. I mean, you know, I mean, basically the constructs of our reality around us are just based on our our five or more senses that we have to create this mental image in our brain. So what difference does it make if I'm in Africa and having that experience or if somebody's imitated that and I'm still having that experience artificially? Um, And back to the question about sound, though, um, I think that's really critical. And Smithsonian has some wonderful sound recordings that they've also saved back in the days when it was like, uh, what do you say, wax recording, you know, like way back. So they, I remember listening to- 45s. One, yeah, well, even before that. <laughs> but the wax recordings, and, and they had one of- and the ice man delivering ice to the ice box, you know, and the sound of the horse drawn cart and the guy getting out and why. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. And so now that sound is like so artificial. What sounds as he brings up today, will we never hear again? And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of those from the natural world that are going to be gone. Um, so good question. Yeah, thank you for the questions. I uh, always appreciate the great questions we get on here on Gray Matter with Michael Krasny. Uh, you're going to go to Brazil in June, though, and I wanted to touch on that because you're going to mainly because of the Jaguars, but uh, boy, what's happening to the Amazon, and thanks to Bolsonaro, uh, must be a source of pain. It it, to me. Yeah, exactly. That guy was, I mean, God, God, I didn't even say this worse than Trump, but uh, almost. Maybe worse. I don't know. Anyway, right on par anyway. Um, But now he's not in the office anymore. So hopefully 
But it's also the international work as well, you know, the soybean production and the conversion of some of the, not Amazon Basin so much as also the surrounding landscape, which lends itself a little bit more to agri uh, industrial agriculture, which you go there, you'll just see fields and fields and fields of soybeans, especially speaking of the Chinese market, actually. Um, and the, but the the Pantanal also, unfortunately, has been being burned as well because of the droughts, uh, similar to what we had here in California for a while. Um, but it is, I've been going to the neotropics since, for well, the first time was 1975. And the first time I saw a jaguar, uh, I'd seen tracks of jaguars, but I'd never seen one until I went to the Pantanal. And then now they have a whole elaborate system of seeing them from the boats and the boat drivers communicate with one another and their jaguars are out hunting in the daytime. Last time I was there, which was right before COVID, we saw eight different species of jaguars in like three days, something like that. So how many jaguars do they have there? They oh, have it's, oh, it's a hotbed of jaguars and they're the largest ones because they're feeding on capybaras and they're feeding on caimans. The food supplies are unlimited. So the, by far, these are the largest jaguars of this of the population of jaguars, which incidentally used to go up into the United States, way up into the United States. We used to have jaguars. And like in Belize, of course, there's a famous jaguar sanctuary. And the, the further you get from the Pantanal, the smaller the jaguars get, actually. But the jaguars in the Pantanal get to be tremendous size, you know, 180 pounds, 200 pounds. Are they facing real problems vis-a-vis -vis extinction like tigers or... Not as bad as tigers. There's almost nothing as bad as tigers, but um, yeah, I mean, not where they're protected, and they they tend to, to keep keep a pretty low profile around human beings. Not nearly as successful as say leopards are. You know, leopards are. You know, there's there's videos of leopards hunting in downtown Mumbai. You know, um, they're they're pretty amazing animals that are able to eat anything from a beetle grub to, you know, dog meat. And I'm talking about leopards right now. The jaguars, uh, most of them that are in the jungle, for example, are so secretive, you just barely ever see them and stuff. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's a big market for their skins and often they're killed. And so I'd say that jaguars in some places are where they're protected or doing okay in other places where they're not or not doing okay. But basically habitat degradation and destruction due to the 8 billion people on the planet Earth right now, everything's suffering. And that would include leopards, panthers, other big cats? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so. Although, you know, since we, you know, mountain lions are coming back in California, which is, you know, I think good news. Um, and uh, in Africa and um, places in the game reserves, they're doing okay, actually. Um, but again, the population pressures of the expanding uh, human beings on the planet are pushing everything on to the edge. So we can't end on that, though. Okay. No, in fact, we got <laughs> some more questions. Uh, thanks again for those of you submitting questions here. Chris from Tempe, Arizona. How do you balance the cost to the biosphere of leading exotic international safaris with the reduced ecological impact of leading domestic, even radically local safaris in North America? No, but could you repeat the question? How do you balance the cost to the biosphere of leading exotic international safaris with the reduced ecological impact of leading domestic, even radically local safaris in North America? Oh, no, that's a, that's that question that I raised about myself earlier. I mean, so the question is, why why spend all this money? Why pump all that carbon into the air to fly across the world to visit another ecosystem that's w really foreign from yours? Um, and th that is the question. I mean, is what is the benefit? OK, the benefit is there's the transfer of wealth basically from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, because the northern hemisphere basically is where all the most of the developed nations are. Uh, people in Africa, Eastern Africa that I know well are struggling financially. If there's a shift of uh, in the economy, there's probably like I think um, in Tanzania, for example, uh, ecotourism is the third largest source of, of revenue for the country. So that's a significant source of money that's coming in from the outside. If um, that economic incentive to protect the wildlife was removed, then we, we can kiss the sort of the biodiversity of Eastern Africa goodbye, because then the population pressures would, would, would basically um, allow pastoralists and other agriculturalists to move into these protected areas and all the wildlife would disappear. So I agree with maybe I, maybe what I should do is just send money to the place, you know, and then make money here in this country doing localized um, 
tours, safaris, if you will. Um, but I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I have a dilemma and there's no answer. Oh, it's all a dilemma for all of us, especially if we love to travel or have the travel bug to any degree. I've been thinking rather maybe than going across uh, the pond or taking trips internationally, there's all these great parks to see. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking, in fact, I was looking at some photographs that you put up. Of <laughs> We've learned, uh, I'll give a plug for, we did a, it wasn't so much with the parks, but we, we did a podcast with Ken Burns and a couple of his producers. Oh, and, cool. Um, and, you know, he's uh, done this extraordinary film on the parks, yeah. on the national parks and their whole history and so forth. But uh, Canyon's Land is kind of a, a little bit of a secret to most people. I mean, I well, I did a, I, I like mountain biking. So that's one of the passions I have. And I we did a mountain, a four day supported mountain biking trip through the Canyon Lands last May. Um, uh, that was, it was called the White Rim Trail. That was amazing. That was so beautiful. I, and it's on a bike, <laughs> you know, so we did have to drive to Canyonlands, but it was on a bike. So um, maybe I'll get some credit with that previous caller. Think about great places to bike. What comes to mind? Oh, my goodness. Well, I live in Santa Rosa, so Annadale's right outside my, um, you know, door, essentially, which is great mountain biking. You know, here in San Rafael, you know, uh, China, China, uh, camp right over behind us now that's a really good place to, to mountain bike i also do gravel bikes which is kind of intermediate you know i don't like road bikes but gravel bikes are like the name indicates it's uh, bikes that are for fire roads and things like that and so this is all local for you all local for me yeah i mean i have i've done you know something called the san juan hut system which is in the i did a mountain a gravel bike from uh, grand junction uh colorado to moab utah uh, and that was fantastic through, and that was kind of gravel, gravel bikes, but on mostly, uh, well-developed surface roads. That was really fun. And it's low impact. You know, I, I just get on my bike and drive, go everywhere actually. Well, we'll stay local for just a moment. Cause Reed's <laughs> in Santa Rosa and Reed says, has Michael Ellis visited the soon to be open to the public? Uh, Harold Richardson Redwood Preserve near Casadero in Sonoma County. No, not yet, but I'm quite familiar with with Casadero because that's where the obviously where the Cedars is. No, I have not had the opportunity to visit that yet. But since that caller is from Santa Rosa, yesterday I did a nice uh, King Ridge. Fort Ross Road loop starting in Casadero. That was on my gravel bike and saw two trucks and two motorcycles and no other bicyclists. So in case he likes to grab a bike in the middle of the week, that's a fantastic place to go. Let me shift gears here for a moment because just the other day I was looking at a story on ABC that was covering, um, this may be a little bit out of your bailiwick, but uh, these zebra sharks. Um, and it was interesting to me because they were actually, this is in Indonesia, they were actually stocking them in Indonesia because they've almost become extinct. And um, I thought, why are we doing this, you know, more than we should? I mean, we should be doing it on so many levels, shouldn't we? Well, you mean like act actively helping species survive? The, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously we should. I'm not sure why um, in Indonesia they were particularly enamored of zebra. Zebra, zebra sharks. Sharks. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, well, sharks have a bad reputation. and Yeah, but know. they're necessary for the ecosystem. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Vital, in fact. Yeah. yeah. I used to do trips to Palau, which was the very first, uh, what was it called? The, the very first shark reserve or something where all, every single shark there is totally protected. So if you like sharks, Palau is the place to go. And a question from Eric in Washington, D.C., and thank you for the question, Eric. What is your opinion of GMO crops in East Africa? Do you think it's a viable way of conserving arable surface area in the name of efficiency or a dangerous trap by embracing monoculture? Wow. Okay. Way out. Speaking of outside of my bailiwick, that's one right there. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the Green Revolution, as everybody's probably familiar with, was, you know, actually was successful and in, in it increased the crop yields. It allowed more people to survive and have a more comfortable life. Um, and as uh, genetically modified crops, um, I mean, <laughs> it was interesting. I was just obviously in Tanzania and I'd see a cornfield and every single, every single corn stalk was exactly the same size, you know? And so that's like, okay, that's, that's, you know, that's genetically modified organisms right there. Um, if it enhances people's ability to survive and perhaps more than survive, but to thrive, then who am I? 
Um, well, it feeds people. It feeds people. And so who am I as a very comfortable person living in, you know, the, the San Francisco Bay Area to say, oh, no, you shouldn't do that because it might get out of hand if that individual is able to sustain and feed his family in a way that he couldn't before. You know, so we're in the still in the gray zone. Um, I'm not sure. Well, we call it gray matter. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I mean, it has a lot to do with that gray, all these gray zones that we live in. Uh, which make for difficult moral decisions all the time. Um, I was looking at your website and I saw birds, birds, birds. They were mostly water birds. Um, and that's fine. Uh, although, you know, the Audubon Society doesn't necessarily put its emphasis on water birds. But I was thinking about robins. Do they really get drunk? On what is that? Uh, those, Pyracantha. Those berries, yeah. No, that's a, that's a myth, actually. Um, in fact, I just did a perspective piece on that for your old... Uh, KQED. Yeah. So basically those berries have a little bit of uh, like the members of the Rose family. I don't you know if y'all remember this, but remember when they were going down to, was it Laetil that they were going down to Mexico because it was a site? Laetil for cancer. Yeah. Laetil for cancer. Well, there's a little bit of cyanide inside the seeds of members of the Rose family. And apparently what's happening to the, to the uh, robins is they're getting a little tiny bit poisoned and disoriented. They're not getting drunk per se on the fermented berries. They're getting a little tiny bits of poison from the cyanide that they're eating in the berries. So they get a little vertigo and disoriented and things like that, but they're not intoxicated. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, had the uh, ability to dispense with that myth. Um, but it's not, a, I love these little kind of factoids, I guess. It's not a myth that uh, snakes, female snakes have clitorises? <laughs> yes, I just saw that. Oh, by the way, Michael, you're a word person. Factoid. Okay. Oid is the Latin ending that means to resemble. Oh, so it's not a real fact. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a real fact. No, you're correct. I, I'm, I, I'm trying to get people to say factito, which I think is what people mean. It's like a little fact. It's a factito. Yes. Factito sounds a little bit like Dorito or something, but I'm, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Sounds but, like something you chomp on. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure the American Heritage Dictionary is going to approve factoid as uh, as meaning a little fact. But yeah, I just read that too. Well, then, you know, these things, uh, plug another podcast we did. Um, uh, we've, we've had one podcast with a li famous linguist and uh, a name that's very recognizable because it's in the New York Times now, um, John McWhorter. And he talks about how things become standard usage, even though they may be wrong. You know, we're using they as a pronoun now, or people are trying to get us. And John seems to think that's probably a good idea because it's being used and it's going to become natural. Well, here's one for you. You said awesome, okay, full of awe. What about awful? What do I make of that? Well, I mean, awful. You mean the awes? Well, yeah, the awes. Okay, one is full of awe, okay, and but that's awful. And awesome, it's got some awe in it, but that's really awesome. It's got the sum of awe. <laughs> yes, but awful. <laughs> Full of awe, yeah. Um, where are we going with this? Well, I let's don't know. Get back to those female snakes. <laughs> the clitoris is, well, I think, you know, one of the things I point out on my Africa trips is that a lot of the, the best long-term studies on animals have been done by female biologists, not by males. I mean, not picking on George Schaller, but George Schaller's famous for the lions and the panda bears and things like that. And he goes in there, he gets his funding, he stays for two or three years, and then he leaves. Okay. Gets Don't we have females leading also uh, like uh, in the world of simians and uh, well, primates? Well, exactly. And but they stay there. Like Shirley Strum with the baboons, with Cynthia Moss with the elephants, Diane Fossey with the gorillas, um, Jane Goodall with the chimpanzees. These are people doing long-term studies, not two or three years. We're talking long-terms. And so those are the biologists that really get some good data. Okay. So I think there's been a male bias I mean, we know that in the medical profession, for example, most of the studies on medicines are done on males. They're not done on females. And there's different physiological differences between us, obviously. And anyway, so this is just the latest example of, you know, everybody knew about the hemipenes of snakes. You know, they have two penises. OK, um, but the clitorises and maybe pleasure. Who knows? You know, because male biologists were the ones looking at the systems. You think um, that that's pretty much turned around now in some ways? I, I mean, hope we so. Have, we probably have more female biologists maybe than male biologists. We have more female doctors than male doctors. Yeah, and lawyers too. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I hope so. I'm, I feels feels like that's the case, you know. Uh, give them a chance to run the planet for a while. We've done a pretty bad job. <laughs> 
Um, we'll go to another question. Uh, this is from Hershert again. Today is St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. He calls it St. Patty's Day. There were talks about avoiding to have local lakes turn into a green color. What are your thoughts? Could we potentially use lead lightning as an alternative? <laughs> Well, I I think well I do have a picture I just saw the other day of of, of uh, they had turned the river in Chicago green actually for St Patrick's Day. Uh, unfortunately, um, some of our lakes and rivers turn green anyway, <laughs> especially in the summertime due to uh, you know toxic algae blooms. So maybe we just need to call St Patrick's Day on the day that we have that toxic algae bloom and things are turning green anyway. Maybe St. Patrick's Day should just be whenever a lake turns green, we call it St. Patty's Day. I don't know what color. I, I'm from Ohio originally, as you know. We had green beer at uh, Ohio University, but I don't know what color Lake Erie is now. I mean, <laughs> at least it's not catching on fire. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Ohio, <laughs> um, let's talk about deer. Um, Rats with good PR, a friend of mine recently described them. And I think that's, <laughs> that's an app, especially if you've got rose bushes and things like that, but carrying ticks. And, you know, but people think about Bambi and they get all, you know, kind of mushy and schmaltzy about deers. But deer are overpopulated as opposed to so many other. Well, it seems like they've come back in big times. And of course, you know, the person growing the rose bushes in the suburbs has a different outlook on life than the deer, which is trying to survive. Although the mountain lions are starting to come back in places and kind of keep the deer in check. But yeah, I mean, the deer are thriving around all the changes that we've made to the uh, landscape, the suburban landscape and watering things and, and thing. And, you know, the deer themselves are just trying to make other deer. I mean, that's the purpose of all living things just to make a copy of yourself. So they're just going about their business, uh, as they know how. So I guess, I mean, I don't have an answer for that question, except that, you know, uh, if we try to restore some kind of balance, I mean, I'm not against hunting, for example, you know, if in appropriate places, if, you know, people want to go hunting deer, you know, use it for food, whatever. I, I have no problem with that, especially in places where, as you mentioned, as your friend mentioned, of course, I can't imagine going hunting for deer in the suburbs of Marin County, for example, but in uh, more appropriate places, you know, that would be one solution to the to the overpopulation of the deer. How about people who say they want to hunt deer with uh, some of these automatic weapons? Uh, <laughs> bow hunting. Let bow me tell you, bow hunters, those are the real hunters. What do you think about the coyote population increasing so much? I mean, they've been, in some areas around here, they don't know what to do about coyotes. You know, yeah, they're I eating mean, little puppies and taking dogs. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm just probably get a lot of uh, listeners mad, but you know, if the coyotes could just take the cats that people let out of their house, that would be a real benefit to the songbird population because there are way too many cats running around killing songbirds in this country. So a lot of them feral cats, though. Uh, a lot of feral cats, but a lot of, I well, I don't know what this percentage are, but I think most of them are probably domestic cats that are well fed, but are still killing birds in the backyard. Um, I forgot how many billions of birds are killed every year by house cats in the United States, but it's huge. At any rate, and they're already having enough trouble as it is. Whereas, so if the coyotes could specialize, may, maybe not killing those little dogs, but maybe killing all the the cats that are running around, I would see that as a great benefit. And you have a kind of thing for chipmunks, don't you? <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Alvin? <laughs> yes. Well, they're pretty cute. I mean, you know, chipmunks are, we only have one species of chipmunk here in the Bay Area. In the eastern United States, there's only one species, the eastern chipmunk, but the 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 world center of chipmunk biodiversity is the Sierra Nevada. Actually, we've got, depending on what altitude you are, you can see probably more than a half a dozen different kinds of chipmunks on a transect through the Sierra Nevada uh, into the desert. That's true. I can attest to that. I remember seeing an extraordinary number of chipmunks up there. Let's go back to travel, though. You've been to Cuba, and I've been to Cuba. Similar observations. People are very spirited. They're wonderful to be around, but the poverty is pretty abject. Oh, it's uh, yeah. I went there in... February, last February, and boy, they were happy to see us because the tourism was way off, as you can imagine. I felt very, it's the first time I've been to that country. I felt very safe there. I just went on my own with some friends. And uh, as you said, the culture there, uh, subsidized by the government, is amazing. You know, sub subsidizing dance troops, artists, 
um, musicians. It's just incredible, extraordinary. And as you said, the poverty is abject, you know, and it's very, I mean, as a tourist, of course, you get special dispensation. They make sure that the tourist places have plenty of food, whereas the other people, uh, the other Cubans, for example, are, are super suffering. I actually have a friend of mine that lives in Cuba, and he just, when I was in Africa, I let him stay in my house. He brought his family out of Cuba for couple of months to try to, you know, re recover a little bit in the United States. He's American. She's Cuban. They have one child. Anyway, so it, it's tough there. So it'd be nice if the Biden administration could lift some of the sanctions against uh, Cuba, although I guess he wants the vote in South Florida, which he's not going to get anyway. So you might as well lighten up a little bit. I mean, when you think about it, that, you know, we've had an embargo against that since, not what, 1959 when Batista was overthrown. Uh, you know, and they're still thriving 90 miles from our coast. I mean, not thriving. They're still surviving. Yeah, yeah I'd say coast. surviving. Too. Surviving, yeah. yeah. Another question, uh, actually, from down in Florida. Where would you go back to revisit as a gem of a place in your personal thoughts? Ah, well, that's good. Well, speaking of Florida, I lived in Coral Gables for a little while. The Everglades is really spectacular. And going down to the Keys, Key West, uh, that's a beautiful place. Um, there's an up in the northern part of Florida as well. I'd like to go back there, the hummocky area and some of the crystal springs where they said the manatees are. I mean, Florida's, you know, Florida's got a, a lot of great places. And I grew up as, as you know, in Tennessee, and I'd like to go back to the great smoky mountains in April for the wildflowers display that's there. So there's, there's a few places that are kind of close to my heart that are like, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Let's talk about flowers, great places to see flowers, especially kind of a panoply of beautiful flowers. Well. What comes to mind? Well, I think this year is going to be spectacular in the California deserts uh, because of the rainfall. My friends that live in the Mojave said that a bunch of the rainstorms have managed to get across. You know, sometimes these barriers that we have, all these mountain ranges, uh, especially the Sierra Nevada, they block the moisture bearing clouds coming from the Pacific Ocean. But every once in a while, they get a couple of scoot over the um, scoot over the mountains and get into the desert. And that's happened this year. So my guess is that Ansborega, the Sonoran Desert, um, it probably have a great wildflower display, as will the Mojave Desert. And the Mojave Desert has lots of different elevations. So you can kind of time your visit to the Mojave Desert, depending on uh, what elevation you are. You can follow the wildflower bloom. Um, and I hope that coastal California also has a great wildflower display. And in, uh, down in Toward Southern California, the Carrizo Plain, which is kind of on Highway 58 uh, west of Bakersfield, California, that usually has one of the most spectacular blooms in California. Also up near Chico, uh, Table Mountain is another fantastic place to look at wildflowers, which should be really good this year. Also on Highway 20 near uh, to the east of Calusa, something called Bear Valley, that should have a good wildflower display. So I, I don't think you can lose this year. I was just thinking when you were talking about the desert, Richard Rodriguez wrote a book about the desert, you know, linked it to all the Abrahamic religions and said there's something about the desert. We were talking before about cathedrals and redwoods-like cathedrals and so forth. But there is something about the desert that gets into the system in a different visceral way. Does that affect? Am I talking to you? In a, yeah, yeah. In a, no, I love the deserts. Um, I crossed the Sahara Desert in 1974, I guess. You know, that was my first desert I'd ever been in. And there's something, the emptiness of the desert, although it's not empty, it just appears empty, but the fact that you can look in a distant area and you can say, I could walk to that mountain right there. And there's nothing in between. There's nothing to stop you. You know, it's just the expanse. It's like the ocean in a way, you know, but also the deserts of, from a biological point of view ha have these little microscopic like belly flowers that they call them, or just look under a hand lens at the, at the sand and look at that. And then you look up and you can see 150 miles away. So just the contrast between that macro and the micro, you know, the desert kind of Whereas the Cathedral of the Redwood Trees, okay, you can't see very far, and here I am in the Redwood Trees. There's something expansive, of kind of, uh, duh, uh, about the desert that really resonates with me. And also, there's so many biblical things, you know, like going into the desert for 40 days, you know. I mean, there's something about— um, That's what Rodriguez talks yeah, about. Yeah, the sh shamanistic point of view where you, you there's nothing to disturb you except to look inward. And perhaps that's why the deserts are so, uh, such a metaphor for that kind of uh, experience that humans have. 
Not yeah. to mention all the all the toads that you can lick and all the cactus buds you can ingest. And and all the uh, things you can see if you're too sleep uh, without thirst or too... Oh, that too. <laughs> overwhelmed by thirst, all the hallucinations and things that go on in the desert. People talk about desert and ayahuasca and all these uh -huh. different kinds of things that they're taking. Um, there's, there's just sometimes too much to see, you know? There's not enough time and there are too many places, too many places particularly that invite us and that we want to see and that we would hunger to see and long to see. Just be in the moment, whatever you got. It's kind of zen, you know? But what have you not seen that you Oh, gosh, seen? there's all sorts of places I've never been because I had to make a living. So I, you know, always revisited the same places over and over again because I knew the trips would fail Ecuador, Galapagos, East Africa, you know, so. But I've never been to Borneo, never been to Papua New Guinea, never been to New Zealand, never been to Australia. Want to go to the salt pan in Bolivia. Like to go to Lake Bacal in Siberia. You know, so, so you're culturally deprived. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but how many of those am I going to get to? I have no idea. But you know, if you, we just have to be here now. You're, I mean, you're totally present right here in the studio, and that's the that's you know what else can you have? There's no only you. I mean, you. There's just these moments. As T. S. Eliot says, you got to be in the now. That's always now. Yes. It's like, like an eternal now or something along those lines. Oh, in that wasteland that he was in, that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really worth seeing. In fact, I think about wastelands, this is our, you know, you're our 30th podcast. 30 is a number that carries a lot of weight with me. Oh, uh, it does. Always has, yeah. Huh. Well, I think about Nick Carraway, the end of The Great Gatsby, saying, I'm 30 years old. It's my 30th birthday. I'm too old to lie to myself anymore with honor. And <laughs> something to hitting 30 almost, you know, like 30, we're getting back to the Abrahamic religions. 33 was the age Christ was when he was crucified. So that always had a big right, identification right. with me and so forth. Um, but then the numbers get a little out of hand, you know. <laughs> you mean like the one you're in right now? The one I'm in right now is, is a bit sobering, yeah, to be sure. But it's also sobering to see all of the wonders of nature. And you've seen a lot of them. I mean, whatever you haven't seen yet, you certainly made a lot of tracks and uh, and left a lot of tracks. You know, we think about people leaving tracks as a central metaphor of whatever mark you can make in life. And there it is. Um, the desire to travel should still remain with you. And uh, I hope it does. You ever get jaded, though, about all this? No. Never. Never. Mm -mm, never. So I was thinking about when, as a kid, I used to watch Marlon Perkins and Mutual oh, yeah. of Omaha. Uh -huh. and never got tired of it. You know, right. it was just insatiable for that. And that's how you've remained your whole life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, as a kid, you know, as a kid, you know, looking in creeks, looking under rocks, and I'm still like 71, almost two, still looking under rocks, still going and finding creeks. <laughs> you know, things change. So when, like, I used to look under rocks as a kid and find salamanders, it was a big thrill, you know, to find a salamander and take it home, but not necessarily a good idea. You know, like, <laughs> I would get caimans, little alligators that my aunt would send me from Florida. That was not a good idea either. <laughs> we had one in a bathtub. It kept getting bigger and bigger. Actually. Did you really? Yeah. Had to turn and it did over you let it go in the sewer of New York? Turn it over to the, to the zoo. It wasn't like <laughs> Phil Bronstein going down, you know, in the Yeah, right, 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 right. Looking for, you know, also getting bit by a Komodo dragon. I remember and, that. Yeah. Was it that Sharon Stone that? Yeah, he was married to Sharon Stone. I, I was think at, that I was, was his Father's Day present. I was at their wedding, as a matter <laughs> of fact, uh, many years ago. And I just noticed that... Um, it's kind of a sad story that uh, she got hurt in this uh, Silicon Valley bank. She had a lot of investment in the bank itself. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Well, she's, I, my understanding is everybody got everything back, but, you know. Uh, no, not if you own stock in it or not if you had. Oh, yeah, right. gotcha. Yeah. I gotcha. mean, if you had deposits or whatever. Right, right, that was, right. Gotcha. That was a different story. So we should think about where you're going next because people like to sign up for Footloose Forays and... Uh, What's what's on tap? Well, I mean, the good news for me is I'm slowing down, kind of like you are. So I'm not doing nearly as many trips as I used to because I have a four and a half year old granddaughter who lives close by, and I've been spending enviable. A, oh yeah. my god! And that was the silver lining of COVID is I got to spend a lot of time with her. It was just such a blessing. So um, yeah, I'm, uh, fortunately, a lot of my trips are full or filling very quickly. You know, so there's the Baja trip is full. The Cedars trip probably is going to be full. Um, uh, the Brazil trip is, that's already full. Um, I do trips to Mono Lake in the fall. Those probably have room. 
Uh, and back to Brazil for just a moment. You're going to see more than jaguars there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jaguars are just the highlight. Capybaras, but also lots of birds, insects, bats. Just everything's connected. So, Because it's not just the Pantanal. It's a habitat called the Chapada as well, which looks like the American Southwest, except with monkeys. And then there's also the Amazon Basin. Um, or the Amazon ecosystem. We're actually not in the Amazon drainage area, but we're in the Amazon basin. So actually this trip to Brazil is like three entirely different ecosystems. The Pantanal, the biggest wetland in the world, the Chapada, which is kind of like a Mediterranean type climate, and then the Amazon uh, ecosystem. All three are connected in one state called Mato Grosso, which is- There's no other place in the world like that where you have three ecosystems uh, in one that, state. that, not so diverse in this one big no. state, you know, of Brazil. Brazil's a huge country, of course, but, you know, this one state. So we have a couple of flights inside, in between, but not very far. You speak know. any Portuguese? No, but I always hire people that speak good English. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Um, I'm going to conclude with you about bananas because I was reading on your website about endangerment of bananas. <laughs> well, well, you get a scared here. You yeah, get, you get, you get the well, primate scared too. It's the Cavendish. Is it Cavendish? I think it's the Cavendish banana, which has some kind of fungus that's attacking it, and that's the one that we get from Ecuador. And all that's the common banana. So I think what we're, what's endangered is the Cavendish banana, not all bananas, but we might have to start getting those little. When you think about bananas, they are so cheap. When you, you yeah. buy them in the market, it's like, this came from Ecuador and I'm paying, you know, like a dollar for a bunch of these things at Trader Joe's or whatever. How does this even work? You know, anyway. Um, so I think that particular, if they're working on uh, stopping this fungus, but if that uh, wipes out all of the Cavendish, by the way, they're all genetically identical. That's the problem. There's no genetic diversity at all. They're all clonal samples. I mean, they're all clones of the same initial banana plant. So there's no... Uh, you know, there's no diversity within the population. So if a uh, fungus gets in, it'll just wipe everything out. Then we'll have to eat those little nice little fat red bananas or those little other ones, you know, so there's lots of different kinds of bananas. Well, I can start manufacturing them. That's uh, where cellular investigations come forward in terms of food. I mean, you're going to make food out of cells. Well, why yeah. not? If, if they can fool us. Which brings me actually to not conclude with bananas, but with what's with the coconut head with you? <laughs> oh, you mean the fact that they, they were kind of scary? Well, they were for you as a they, boy, yeah. They were, yeah. I was, mean, we all have our own terrors in childhood, but yours was a coconut head? Well, it was this coconut head that was in the closet, and if I left the closet door open, okay, that coconut head would be staring at me all night long when I was there, so I had to make sure I closed that, that door. I can't believe you found that story somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll put on my uh, gravesite. He did his homework, and uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Always it, a delight. It was really fun. Michael Ellis, Footloose Forays. And I want to thank all of you who were with us uh, for this podcast live today and all who will hear it in the future. I also want to remind you or invite you once again, if you've not taken advantage of this invitation that I give out, not to procrastinate any longer. Become a member of this growing and exciting community of members of Gray Matter with Michael Krasny, and simply go to graymatter.show to do that. Thanks also to our Gray Matter with Michael Krasny team, Alex, Shannon, Colin, Chad, Kevin, and Malachi, and a special thanks to this episode's guest, Michael Ellis. I'm Michael Krasny. Thanks. Bandwidth for Gray Matter is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com.